My guest is Roger Savory. We're continuing our conversation about how to turn deserts into grasslands. Roger, how are you doing today? Oh, I'm good. Even when I'm bad, I'm good. Sounds good. So we've decided to talk about dung beetles, and I am uh, excited about this because it's one of those little aspects of the ecosystem that is very important, and we don't think about it, and we don't know very much about it. So Roger is going to enlighten us. So Roger, what would you like for us to know about dung beetles? Um, Hart, there's so much about these little guys that I absolutely love. I have spent uh, 30, 35 years sitting in paddocks, watching dung beetles, watching the results of the amazing work they do. And um, we're all very familiar with what a big yellow uh, D9 bulldozer can do. We're all very familiar with, um, you know, what uh, uh, front end loaders can do um, and graders can do. Um, and yet with all of that technology, we still have massive flooding and everything. And no one pays attention to the fact that a dung beetle can prevent flooding. So with all of our fancy technology, none of it equals those tiny little insects. So let me guess about how dung beetles might prevent flooding. For one thing, they dig a hole in the ground and water goes into that hole. For another thing, they increase the fertility of the soil, the organic matter in the soil, making the soil more like a sponge. Am I on the right track with that? Uh, uh, the very beginning of the right track, yeah. Um, but uh, I don't even know how many species there are. Um, on Facebook, there's a, a Facebook page called Dung Beetle Exchange, where um, farmers and ranchers now realizing the importance of dung beetles are actually exchanging dung beetles with each other trying to build back up populations. But I got lucky, I grew up in Africa, so I'm used to our big rhino and scarab uh, dung beetles. I mean, we've got, we've got big guys. Um, and, then, uh, and then I moved to Australia where they had a massive program to reintroduce dung beetles. Um, the majority, I think, of the species they brought came in from France. Um, so, um, what we find around the world is there's uh, dung beetles that do really well in cold climates. There are dung beetles that do really well in monsoon climates, et cetera, et cetera. And what I have noticed, um, and this is, yeah, I'm not an entomologist. This is just observation in the field. What I've noticed is that where we have high rainfall events, the dung beetles are much bigger. Where we have monsoonal flooding kind of events, the holes that dung beetles dig are much deeper. Now, I can't help but feel that there's a bit of a, you know, a, a evolutionary um, symbiotic uh, thing. For example, we've got a dung beetle in Africa. He or she or they make the dung ball that they roll is about that big. So I call it two inches diameter. But around that two inch diameter, they then make a clay ball that they protect their dung ball with. And this clay ball is, it, it's, it's, it's like ceramic clay. It is rock, rock hard. Now that four inch dung ball, um, some of the researchers decided to dig, dig some up and they found them 10 meters deep. Now, if you're digging a four inch channel, 10 meters deep, and you've got millions of these dung beetles following giant herds. I mean, what, they're 2 million wildebeest in one of the migrations. So you've got enough dung beetles to bury all the dung from 2 million wildebeest every single day. And they're digging 10 meter, up to 10 meter deep holes, four inches in diameter, and taking it from rock solid to fluffy and, and aerated, what type of aeration is that doing? Yeah, we know that plants need oxygen, water, and sunlight. Well, now if you're making an oxygen channel 10 meters deep, and a water channel 10 meters deep, can you imagine how your plants would flourish and grow? Mm -hmm. Right. You know, yeah, we've got a plow 
And we get excited if we can get the chisel of the plow down 13 or 14 inches. Hello? 10 meters, 30 feet? What's that in inches? 120 so, inches? So this is an example of an animal like, I like to think of animals of all types. They, when they move through the ground, they leave a burrow the size of their own body and dung beetles do the same. So, so they're leaving a, a burrow in the ground, they're digging a hole, and they're also taking the dung and burying it down there, providing no doubt a lot of fertility and probably setting up an ecosystem down there. Well, so that's the second part of it. Now, so this, this dung beetle goes down there and for that ball of dung, let's call it a two inch ball or a half inch ball, depending on which variety it is. They then only lay two eggs in that ball. So now there's two larva that get to eat that ball before they then become beetles. Yeah, they uh, larva, then they pupate, mm -hmm. then they turn into beetles. And then when the beetle is now a young hatching beetle, it digs its way out and goes back up to the surface. Now, there are so many other symbiotic things that happen now. That dung that was buried brought spores, fungal spores, down underground. Hello? We've just helped complete the life cycle of fungus. Oh, the tick that fell off the animal at the same time as the dung did, it hatched after 10 days, and the nymph is now waiting to climb back on a grazing animal to complete its life cycle. Hold on, the grazing animals, there's 2 million of them, they are now 100 miles away. Mm. Tick's got six little or eight little legs. He can't, he can't catch up. Um, six little legs. Um, he can't catch up to that herd. Mm. And if he doesn't have a blood host within six months, guess what? He dies. Now, we know this about ticks. We know that if a tick doesn't have a blood host within six months, it dies. So if this migration went 800 miles, 1,000 miles, whatever, and they came back once a year, why are ticks not extinct? Hold on. Tick falls to the ground, nymph hatches. One tick, one giant blue tick, has up to 100,000 nymphs. So one tick becomes 100,000. If 100,000 babies climbed onto the herd, they would suck them dry and kill them. Mm -hmm. but if those nymphs are all on the ground and a dung beetle comes crawling out of the ground when he's finished his system, which is within the six month period, and that nymph can latch onto the dung beetle and bury itself in the joints of the legs. Now that dung beetle who has wings and can smell the herd scent on the air currents flies and catches up to the herd, guess what? Hmm. Ticks don't go extinct. Mm -hmm. Now, whoever thought that there was a symbiotic relationship between a dung beetle, fungus, and a tick? Oh, and by the way, some of those funguses also kill the ticks. Some of those funguses also kill dung beetles. Some of those funguses also make ticks stronger. Some of those funguses also make dung beetles stronger, livestock stronger, plants stronger. There is so much complexity. We cannot even begin to understand it. But I'll tell you what, it was a real aha moment the day I was sitting down, picked up a dung beetle and went, huh, what are those? Got a magnifying glass out and went, oh, those are baby ticks. Mm -hmm. Penny dropped. Hey, this is the taxi to catch up to the herd again. Now, on another occasion, my herd of cattle um, was about 2,000 head. And in the dry season, we would find the herd by looking for the dust on the horizon, and I would walk in towards, um, towards the dust. There generally weren't um, uh, that many dung beetles during the dry season. But in the wet season, when I couldn't see the dust, and I would go looking for the herd, I would literally just walk 
in the general direction of where I knew they were until, wow, wow. I mean, when you've got a big two, three inch dung beetle flying past you, well, firstly, you hope it doesn't hit you in the face. The damn thing's <laughs> hurt. Mm -hmm. um, but you would pick up the direction that they were flying. Now you knew you were in the air current directly behind the herd. You would turn and walk with the dung beetles and they would literally be coming past your ears. Hmm. And you would follow this trail, this airborne trail of dung beetles until you arrived. Oh, there's the herd in front of us. Guess what the herd were doing? They were being absolutely silent. They wouldn't bellow. They wouldn't moo. You would not hear a single sound out of 2,000 cattle. The only, herd you hear, the only sound you would hear was their munching of the grass which you could only hear when you were close to them. Mm -hmm. But 2,000 animals did not make a murmur. Well, what's the evolutionary reason for that? Hello, it's the wet season. We've got baby calves on the ground. Mm. Well, one group of people we don't want knowing that we're here is called lions. Mm -hmm. So we're not going to make any noise and we're not going to advertise our, ourselves so that the lions can't find us easily. But I was able to figure out that, ah, but I could find them, not by sound and not by dust like I did in the dry season, but by following dung beetles. It was a super highway of dung beetles. Now, the next thing that I also noticed was that because we were moving our herd forward in, in 10 minute increments, uh, every 10 minutes we were going forward 100 yards. Because, because of that, um, what I noticed was that just three increments back, so 30 minutes after the herd had moved forward, we physically couldn't find any dung on the ground anymore. In other words, so many dung beetles followed that herd that 2,000 cows worth of shit was gone in only 30 minutes. Three, zero. They had made their balls and started the bearing process. So, um, you know, incredibly efficient. Now, if you're a fly maggot looking for dung to lay your eggs in, where's it gone? So if you go to Australia, they have got a massive, massive fly problem. It's the worst country on the planet for flies. When you're in outback Australia, it's absolutely miserable. There are flies in your eyes. There are flies up your nostrils. There's flies in your mouth. You wear mosquito netting over your head to try and keep the flies out just so you can breathe and talk. Mm. It is miserable. I mean, the channel country is just horrible. But when they introduced dung beetles to Australia, the researcher and the scientist who, I, who I've met and, and know, they did all their research based on the environmental conditions around uh, Canberra, around the capital city. Well, that was a very wet, shallow soil uh, area, very much like Europe. So they imported French beetles that only bury the dung six inches deep. And they've got a tiny little dung ball. Mm -hmm. That was the wrong dung beetle for the whole of Australia. But the bureaucracy only allowed them to bring in those species mm -hmm. because the research had only done the research on those species but what the channel country in the north of queensland and uh, darwin and all those areas they need the big african one that's used to nine months of dry season or two years of dry season and then that's also used to the monsoon rains that can so you vary. Think they it. should introduce different species to Australia. They should, yeah, they should have habitat specific species. Um, and uh, because they need those big 10 meter deep channels that are four inches wide, mm -hmm. so that when they get one meter of rain, which they do get in Australia yeah. um, uh, in a few days, all those really deep big channels are there to bury that uh, done really deep. Now, the other thing that that will do is it'll make it so that fly problem that they have you know, in the outback disappears because the source for the maggots is gone. It's buried deep in the ground. So they, yeah, and that'll fix the water cycle. That'll stop the flooding. Um, now, coming back to our fixed deserts project in the Salton Sea, 
it, I believe it's absolutely vital that a lot of what we're doing while we're fixing the, the getting the dung on the ground and we're doing all the stuff with the animals and the forage, what I also uh, want us to concentrate on is the dung beetles because I understand how important they are. Mm -hmm. Do you have to bring them in? Yes. Um, and, and for the simple reason that um, uh, many years ago, I coined a phrase, and I'm going to get in trouble for this, but I coined a phrase that um, ivermectin was the DDT of the 90s. And the reason I coined that phrase was quite simply that ivermectin killed our dung beetle population in North America. We used to have um, really good dung beetle populations in America. They really didn't die out too badly when the bison were killed out because they were replaced with cattle. We still had a lot of dung beetle species. We still had high dung beetle populations. But after ivermectin came in, now it was used as a dewormer for the worms in the stomach. But unfortunately, it had a residual effect. It killed the two larvae that were in the dung buried underground. So, um, so dung beetle populations plummeted, no one was paying attention, and by the time the warning bells were, were rung, it was basically a done deal and it was too late. Mm -hmm. So America right now is almost like Australia, as in guys are now having problem with flies and other issues and flooding because we accidentally removed our dung beetles. So one of the big reasons why we have drought and desertification in, and not very much drought resilience in the American West is not having complete ecosystems in place, including not having the animals that are needed to you know, complete the ecosystem and provide all the benefits. Am I on the right track with that? And are dung beetles included in what's lacking uh, so as to prevent flooding and drought? Absolutely, absolutely. So now let me connect it to the flooding. That's fairly easy for people to picture. If you have a 10 meter deep hole in the ground that's four inches wide um, from a dung beetle that used to be supported by a mammoth in America. Remember we had mammoths only 38,000 years ago. And I say 38, we know we were killing them 38,000. So they might have been here as recently as 12,000. I don't know when the last mammoth died. Mm -hmm. um, but um, you know, on, a, on an ecological scale, that's yesterday. Um, and then, uh, so, we, so we had mammoths. I'm going to guess that the dung beetle that buried a mammoth um, uh, dung pile was probably a pretty impressive dung beetle. Mm -hmm. um, I, yeah, I don't know what they would have looked like, but mammoth uh, dung would have had cotton, cottonwood bark in it. Mm -hmm. It would have had um, yeah, willow bark in it. Uh, it would have had all the grasses in it. So it would have been a very fibrous dung. You would have needed a pretty intense dung, dung beetle to bury that dung. Mm -hmm. Then we had the giant buffalo. I think we've got six bison species that we know that have that we know existed. I think five have gone extinct. And the fifth one is hanging on by its toenails. Mm -hmm. Well, those, uh, those bison, some of them were nearly twice as tall as a human. I mean, they were massive. Um, so uh, that would have had a huge dung pile. Well, I'm guessing like our big African scarab um, dung beetles, the big rhino dung beetle, I'm guessing for the bison, we had those guys. Well, if we had those, by definition, they would have had such a meaty lava that predators would have been wanting to dig their lava up. The only ones that would have survived were the ones would have been the ones that buried their dung so deep that it wasn't energy efficient and cost effective for a coyote or a fox or whatever or a badger to keep digging and digging because they're burning energy while they're digging. Right to keep digging until they got to it. So there's this kind of this equilibrium. How much energy does the dung beetle need to put in to get it buried so mm -hmm. that it's buried safely? How much energy does this bigger creature that's digging to get that energy out need to put in to dig to get it out? Um, and, and so that's where this kind of this equilibrium comes up. Now, remember the dung beetle goes down there, buries, buries the dung, he only 
lays two eggs in it. Then he comes up and then he flies on that wind current to go and catch up to the herd again. So there's two parts to it. There's the, the adult mature dung beetle who's flying to catch up the herd. Then a month or so later, two months later, there's the larva that's hatching that's then also going to go and find the herd. So there's two flights that are kind of occurring. Um, and that's two occasions for the ticks and the worms and the parasites to catch up. Um, but, it, you know, I think from what I've seen of the bison, I think they were migrating pretty much from Mexico all the way up to Canada. I think they had a really giant migration pattern. You know, if you look at the San Luis Valley in, in, uh, in Colorado, if you look at the Rio Grande Valley in, in New Mexico, you figure down in the south, spring would have come a lot earlier. So that's where everything would have been growing. And then as spring progressed going north, that herd would have just kept going north, always being on spring grass until it's up in Canada. Well, spring in Canada is June. Spring in Mexico is Feb now, February, March. Yeah, March, April, May, June, that's four months of spring as they keep going north, just staying on the precious grass. Well, now they get all the way north, it's June. Oh, oh we got to head south before winter comes. So you've got your four, yeah, four to five to six, and they couldn't have headed south on the same route because they've just eaten that grass and it hasn't recovered yet. So now they've got to go east or west and then come back south on the next route. So there would have been an entire year recovery before anything got regrazed again. So they, yeah, they would have grazed up, you know, 800 miles, 1,000 miles, 2,000 miles north, and they would have come over and, and, and come back down. Um, and, uh, you yeah, know, so all of this would have had the symbiotic relationship with these dung beetles. Um, and, uh, and, and how do we recreate it? Well, they're gone. We have to protect them. We have to breed them up. We have to exchange them. We've definitely got to get rid of ivermectin. It's, it, it's got to go. They, we, it shouldn't be sold in America at all. I don't know. I don't care how much good it does. The bad it does is a hundred times worse. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and the more farmers and ranchers learn that, um, the better it'll be. Because what is the cost to your ranch when you suffer from a drought? Mm -hmm. How much hay do you have to buy? Was it worth that, you know, that 10, 20 pounds of additional weight gain you got on your cattle to have to buy thousands of dollars of hay? What happens when you have a flood and your fields get washed out and your house gets washed away and your bridge gets washed? Was it worth that 10 or 20 pounds of extra weight gain you got? You know, when we look at things linearly and we're just looking at a small piece and we say, oh, We've got worms in our cattle. Let's deworm. Let's use ivermectin. Oh, and the salesman can tell you. Oh, look at your additional mm -hmm. weight. You know, just look at one aspect. It looks fantastic. But when you look at the whole picture, you go, whoa, we don't want to do that. That's, I hadn't considered those aspects. That's disastrous. Um, and kind of the canary in the coal mine for ranching uh, is the dung beetle and, uh, and is the damage that the dewormers um, have done to the uh, dung beetles. And I have read the research on all the dewormers, including the dung beetle safe um, dewormers. There isn't any. Yeah, you know, when you read all the research, they all say they get it up to a certain point and then they say in their own results, we need further research. Mm -hmm. But if you read the companies, and I'm even talking to organic companies, when you read their research, they get to such a point they don't want to go further because they actually know what the results will be and the results are negative. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, so yeah, there, there, isn't, uh, there isn't a way of deworming that doesn't negatively impact uh, dung beetles. However, you can reduce the worm burden on your livestock by planning your grazing to make sure you're out of a paddock for six or nine months or a year mm. before returning to lower the, both the tick and the worm um, uh, uh, burden on your livestock.
Um, so it, it all kind of works together. You know, and then that leads into another thing. Well, are farms big enough to allow for these long recovery periods? Uh, you know, and in the, the forested east coast of America, the answer is no. You know, out west, the answer could be yes if farmers and ranchers work together, amalgamated herds and did their planning together. Uh, does it require a completely different mindset? Absolutely. Uh, are we desperate enough to get there yet? Probably not. Hmm. Um, but uh, I think we're getting, you know, we're getting to a tipping point, a turning point where we've got to start taking all these things seriously and, and put it into our planning. Do we have the capability to fix it all if we change our thinking? 100%. Mm -hmm. so, uh, it's, uh, the problem isn't in the paddock. The problem isn't with the dung beetle. The problem isn't with the worm. The problem is right here. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, dung beetles, fantastic little guys. I don't know of anything better for stopping floods and by the same token for stopping droughts. Now, why do they stop droughts? Well, if that much more water went into the ground during the rainy season or during even a poor wet season, there's that much more, more water stored in the soil to be released to plants in a drought year. Mm -hmm. You've got that much deeper channels of carbon holding, soaking and holding water. Um, so, so they'll prevent the floods because the water can go in. They'll prevent the droughts because they will store uh, more carbon and more moisture through through the dry years. Um, and we've definitely seen this in Zimbabwe at Deep and uh, where yeah, our research um, you know, kind of first started um, in earnest. We've had uh, at Deep and uh, I think I'm correct. I think we had nine below average rainfall years. So nine years where we just didn't get as much rain as we needed. Our rivers continued to flow and you know, we grew unlimited grass. We mm. needed to keep increasing our stocking rates. We didn't have enough animals. Um, but I'll tell you what, we've got very, very, very healthy populations of dung beetles. So, so they are vital. Now, before we had those healthy populations of dung beetles, our soil was like concrete. Mm -hmm. Um, so yes, they all go very well together. Roger, what else would you like for us to know and how can uh, people stay in touch with you? What else would I like people to know? Uh, think holistically, plan holistically, support us in our fixed deserts uh, project, fixeddeserts.com. Um, is it, it's uh, for the deserts to grasslands, feeding the future project. Uh, we're desperate to get people to say, hey, this is a serious problem. These guys are, are having a crack at solving one of the oldest problems on the planet. Um, they're trying to work with entire ecosystems, uh, entire monetary systems, entire communities. Um, uh, let's get behind them and support them. And it starts by going to fixdeserts.com and subscribing so we can get your email um and and share it share it share it we've got to grow a movement um uh and uh, and thank you hart for bringing publicity to this and uh, and anyone who happens to listen to this who gets uh, excited you know we've got to get on bbc news we've got to get on the you know the rogan podcast we've got to get um you know on cnn we've got to get on fox uh, we've got to get people talking about this um because um because I think it's a little bit more important than a TikTok or a, or or, or, you know, or 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 falling off a skateboard. But I'm happy to fall off a skateboard if someone wants wants <laughs> me to do it. But uh, no, the big thing is let's just uh, as individual Americans let's bring publicity to this and talk to our senators, talk to our congressmen, and uh, just get the excitement that there is hope. Um, and who would have thought the lowly dung beetle, the shoveler of dung. Um, is, is kind of a gold mine and gives us all hope. I'm excited because I think this is the key to the future. Uh, thank you, Roger, uh, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom. And we'll talk again soon. Thank you, Hart.